Professional greyhound trainer Martin Wiley is not only interested in training dogs, he is also a qualified personal trainer and fitness fanatic. He has spent a decade since he took over his dad Ernie's licence, applying human theories to dogs. I took over the licence from him probably around about 10 years ago. Um, I, I, worked, I worked for him uh, pretty much as I left school. Um, and yeah, I was never gifted anything, so I was a kennel hand, and then uh, head kennel hand, and then an assistant trainer. And uh, when he eventually decided to retire, or as he would call it, semi-retire, and to be fair, he still has an active role, um, uh, I took over the, uh, the contract in Romford and I've been there ever since. And outside of greyhound racing, which is very much your job, you're a massive fitness enthusiast, aren't you? Yeah, I, I've, um, I, I like to keep myself busy outside of work as well so I have interests that go on outside of dog racing but I try, try to pick ones that stimulate me and ones that sometimes will have a payback to what I do for, for a day job so I've become a, a personal trainer and I, I love doing the little bit of it I do just for fun but it, I also the, the qualification gave me an insight into uh, anatomy and an insight into uh, nutrition that I've been able to use in my day job. Uh, I'm also a sports massage therapist and also an Ironman coach. Um, so that again gives me a greater understanding of what a, a true athlete needs in nutrition. And it really is evident here, not just in the food, but also in the treatment. You're very confident in checking over dogs and treating them yourself. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm qualified to detect injuries in humans at uh, a uh, uh, low level, which is the only level I need for greyhound racing. My experience in greyhounds, coupled with a qualification that is purely for humans, but you know, it, it, it's linked, helps me to understand the, the biomechanics of a greyhound and the anatomy of a, of a greyhound fairly well. And uh, along with the correct vet, veterinary advice, it, it gives me an understanding of how to treat injuries and how to find injuries early on. Uh, and we have a good recovery rate. So you have good exercise facilities here as well. I don't think I've ever heard a trainer talk to me about exercising a dog aerobically and anaerobically before. <laughs> yeah, well, again, that, that's, a, that's a payback from understanding which, what exercise regime fits what dog and, and what, what you can achieve out of what you're doing out of the exercise you do. You know, it's, uh, it, it, if you've got a dog that only runs sprints, you don't really need to be working them aerobically, uh, you, you know, and vice versa. If you've got a long distance dog, you don't really need anaerobic work. And it interests me very much what different trainers feed. Uh, we've seen what you feed here today, but what is the science behind what you give them? Dogs work on fats, not, not so much carbohydrates. It's very much an opposite to what we do. So, you know, it's, it's about tailoring their diets uh, for the mass of the dogs we've got and individually uh, for what their needs are. You, you know, so some, some dogs need uh, building up, some dogs don't. Some, some dogs, you know, need support and others don't. There's a lot of thought gone into the facilities here and you make great use of both the whirly and the gallop, don't you? Yeah, and the swimming pool. You, you know, we, we like to think that we've probably got a 10 month of the year training program. This year it's been longer. Um, and what I mean by that is when everything's frozen, there's, I, I don't think there's many ground trainers in the country that are able to actually exercise the dog apart from lead walking. And I'm no different. Where we would be different in autumn and spring, we have the whirly gig and the gallop. You know, some trainers would have a gallop, some would have a whirly gig. We're lucky enough to have both. Um, but in the summer months, we can swim them, and we can swim up to 20 or 30 a day um, because we have a swimming pool on site. So we don't have to move for it. The dogs love it. They, they feel refreshed for it, especially, especially if you think about the summer that we've just had. Um, you know, most places were struggling to transport dogs and exercise them and bring them back, you know, sensibly. Um, and lots of trainers would have chose rightly not to do that. Whereas we didn't, we had a swimming pool on site, didn't have to go anywhere. The dogs cool off and refresh and dry out in the sun. And the whirly you've got is really useful for not just pups, but also greyhounds who might have lost a bit of interest. Yeah, well, we're having good re re results with, with the whirly gig. We, we, we uh, built it to the end of uh, last year and 
you know, we're slowly experimenting and working it, and we're finding that it's very good for pups, and, and we're getting good results with pups running fluent bends, first or second look at a scoring trap. But we're finding with the adult dogs that have lost a bit of interest, that are finding one for just the, the same old thing yet again, and we we put them down the drug and try and stimulate them in other ways. But we're finding that actually the whirly gig, we get some really good results from using that about re re-energizing the dogs and refocusing them they, they they seem to respond well for it there is also a real emphasis here on training staff something that you're very hands-on with yeah i i consider my, my role is to organize the kennels for the day but then to spend time training the staff that i have the, the better i make them the better our operation is you know the, and also the, it's very simple just to teach us up a member of staff a small amount and then expect them to get on with it and be satisfied with that. But it, I, I'm one that I love to learn and I love to have interest in what I'm doing. And the more I can teach them, the more I can involve them, and the more idea they have of what the bigger picture of ground racing is, the more enthusiastic they are and the more they want to come here and work for us. And of course, that means the dogs get better looked after, but you also make sure that you look after your owners very well, particularly on, on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, we, we've... Um, for for a year or so, maybe a, a little bit more, we um, we we cook bacon rolls and I uh, always have tea and coffee. And we make, maybe do sort of twenty or thirty bacon rolls on a Sunday morning. It's a very social thing. Um, people can just stop and chat and uh, and talk about the dogs. They take the, the you know they've taken their dogs for a walk and they can generally just talk about what's going on. Um, but it also as a byproduct is that we we ask them. We don't charge for bacon rolls, tea or coffee, but we ask them to make a small donation, whatever that they want to, uh, there's no set amount. Uh, and what we can raise money for retiring uh, our own dogs or other dogs, or just generally writing a cheque for, for some of the retirement agencies. What's really impressed me here today, and I visit a lot of kennels, is that I can walk down your kennel block and the dogs aren't even fussed about getting off their beds. They're very content and happy, well looked after greyhounds. Is that something that's important to you? It's important that they're content and well looked after. It, you know, I've, I've um, long maintained if we, we can't do a job properly, it's not worth doing it and we shouldn't do it. If we can't give it 100% and we can't get the results we want. And that doesn't mean in performance, that, that means in standards. Yeah, I've long advocated that there should be a minimum requirement uh, for a kennel standard. And it's not just about the size of the kennel, it's about the quality of the care that they can provide and I think that's important that it's regulated firmly if we can't hit the standards we want for welfare, kennel cleanliness, getting to the track on time, if we can't hit that then we shouldn't be doing it. Me and my dad before me and with me now we've, we're very house proud and as you've seen today there's no point uh, part of a kennel that we don't want you to see. We're quite happy for you to wander around on our own. And that's the same for our owners. And we, when we get new clients come to us, they're very surprised that they can just walk around the kennel supervised as they want to. There's not a bit we don't want to show people because we're proud of what we do.